Alongside the power and complexity of the NASA Saturn V, Russia came to the first space race equipped with their own heavy-duty weapon of choice, the N-1. While slightly physically smaller, the N-1 was designed to produce more thrust in each of its three stages than the corresponding stages of the Saturn V, with the first stage producing 10.2 million pounds of thrust. Designed by Sergei Korolev, the godfather of Russian rocketry, the N-1 lunar program suffered greatly following Korolev's death in 1966. While it would launch a total of four times, all N-1 rockets would fail, and it would never even reach space before the program was suspended in 1974 and cancelled in 1976. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. So, the parts list. The N1 began with the impressive Block A, the first stage, which was powered by NK-15 engines. How many NK-15 engines, you may ask? Oh, 30? Yes, you heard me correctly, 3-0. Arranged in two rings at the base of the rocket, together they would have made up the most powerful engine ever built, and indeed achieved their goal for at least a few seconds at worst. This was the only stage of the rocket that ever actually fired. Stage 2 was called, predictably, Block B. It was powered by eight NK-15V engines arranged in a single ring. The only difference in the engines were that the bell nozzles were widened for high-altitude performance. The second stage was capable of withstanding a shutdown of six out of the eight engines, but unfortunately, never got the chance to be tested properly. Stage 3, called Block V, mounted four smaller engines called NK-21s in a square. It was capable of functioning with one of the four shut down, but again, never fired. I could go on about the Soviet lunar lander proposal, but that's an entirely different subject and I may have to save it for later. For now, let's focus on the four times the N1 was put on the launch pad with the intention of going to space. Launch number one, February 21st, 1969, 9.18am UTC. Nearly half a year before NASA would put boots on the moon, the first N1 is scheduled to do a lunar flyby mission. A few seconds after liftoff, a transient voltage caused the engine control system to shut down number 12. After this happened, the system also shut off number 24 to maintain symmetrical thrust. This was relatively fine, but at T plus 6 seconds, the vehicle began to experience pogo oscillation. This is a phenomenon that has more or less been solved at this point, and requires a lot of explanation, but here's a crash course. Pogo oscillation occurs when the engines experience a surge in pressure, which causes back pressure to build, reducing pressure, causing more fuel to come in and increasing pressure again. As a result of this unstable combustion cycle, the vehicle would quite literally begin to bounce back and forth on its longitudinal axis, which can create instability that can both damage the rocket and the spacecraft. The Saturn V also experienced problems from pogo oscillation, which was fixed by the time of Apollo 11. By the time of the space shuttle, engineering had basically edged pogo oscillation out of existence. For more information on what pogo oscillation is and how it's accounted for, I'll leave a link in the description. And now I'm going to say pogo oscillation one more time because it sounds really bizarre. Moving on. These experienced instabilities in the N1's engines caused several of number 2's components to tear off and begin a fuel leak. About 20 seconds later, a fuel line ruptured and caused RP1 to spill into the aft section of the booster, bringing it in contact with the first leak and starting a fire. The fire burned electrical components and caused the control system to go haywire, shutting down the entire first stage at T plus 68 seconds.
July 3, 1969. The second N1 vehicle is on the launch pad. Launch is scheduled for 11.18 p.m. Moscow time in the middle of the night. The first stage fires its many engines and for a few moments, the rocket lifts into a sky that suddenly as bright as day. However, as soon as it clears the launch tower, a bright flash is seen beneath the first stage, and debris was spotted falling off of the rocket. All of the engines, save for one, immediately shut down, and the entire N1, full of fuel, tipped at a 45 degree angle and dropped back onto the launch pad. The failure of the second N1 created one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in human history, the 2300 tons of propellant triggering a massive blast that shattered windows across the launch complex and sent debris flying as far as 10 kilometers or 6 miles from the launch pad. The failure was found to be caused by an explosion with the number 8 engine, leading to the other engines gradually shutting off one after the other until its TWR was negative and it began to fall. Its tilt was caused by engine number 18, which operated perfectly until impact. At this point, the race to the moon was over. While the Soviets were still cleaning up the mess of the second launch attempt, Apollo 11 lifted off. Nevertheless, the N1 wound up back on the launch pad on June 26, 1971. Soon after liftoff, due to unexpected eddies and countercurrents at the base of the first stage, the rocket began to roll beyond the capability of the control system to compensate. Sensing the problem, the system sent a shutdown command to the first stage. However, a new addition had been made to the guidance computer following the N1's second launch. Due to the sheer devastation caused by the rocket crashing directly back onto the pad, the computer was no longer able to shut down the first stage until 50 seconds after liftoff. The rolling continued and accelerated, from 6 degrees per second to 40. This caused the guidance system to go into gimbal lock, and 10 seconds later, the interstage truss between stages 2 and 3 tore apart, and the lower stages disconnected while the upper stages continued to travel for 7 kilometers before crashing down. The engineers went back to the drawing board and started coming up with fixes in preparation for another, final attempt. November 23, 1972. The fourth N1 launches a dummy payload intended for lunar flyby. It goes well for some time. At T plus 90 seconds, the six center engines perform a pre-programmed shutdown, essentially causing the vehicle to lower its thrust for max Q like many other spacecraft do. However, the sudden shutdown caused a hydraulic shockwave in the lines feeding fuel and oxidizer to the remaining engines. One of the lines burst and started a fire in the booster, and at the same time, the number 4 engine exploded. For the first time, the launch escape system activated and pulled the dummy spacecraft away from the exploding booster. The remaining upper stages crashed into the step. This launch was, arguably, the most impressive of the four, with the whole rocket reaching 40 kilometers in altitude without any issues at all. Nevertheless, the N1 program was over. The Soviets were not going to the moon. So, what exactly went wrong with the N1? In short, it was too complicated, and it wasn't tested enough. The NK-15 engines used valves that, once shut, could not be reopened. This meant that the entire cluster of 30 engines was never subjected to a static test fire before launch. If you're unfamiliar with static test fires, that's basically when the launch system is ignited exactly like it would for launch, except it remains connected to the launch control system. We've seen a number of these for SLS recently, and hopefully we'll see one for Orbital Starship soon. These test fires are important for testing the reliability of the engines, and the inability to do one heavily contributed to the failure of the N1. In addition, 30 engines requires an immensely complex system of plumbing to feed them, and their failure from too much stress contributed to two of the four failures. Overall, it was a monumental but somewhat rushed design that made it prone to failure through lack of rigid testing. Somewhere, in an alternate universe, the N1's engines were modified to allow for static test fires, and the Soviets landed on the moon alongside the Americans. Or before them. If you enjoy this content, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really enjoy this content, consider donating on Patreon, becoming a member, buying some of my books on Amazon, or buying some of my merch. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys.